So, so far we've talked about what a model is, how to visualize models, and where we use models. And the focus of this video is fitting and interpreting models. We're going to start with models with numerical explanatory variables. Remember that we're working with the Paris Paintings data set, where we have 3,393 observations from the auction catalogs for these paintings, and we have information on 61 variables. We know the price they sold at, which we'll get to a little bit later, but we also know their heights and their widths, and that's what we're starting with first. So our goal is to predict the height of the paintings from their width. And the formula above the visualization here basically says that the predicted height of a painting, so the, um, the little I next to it basically stands for um, each painting, so it could be going from one through uh, 3,393, uh, is equal to beta zero, which stands for the slope, plus, uh, I'm sorry, beta zero, which stands for the intercept, plus beta 1, which is the slope, times the width of that painting, so width i. We're going to use a new framework for fitting these models called the Tidy Models Framework. So as you can imagine, this is very similar uh, to the Tidy Models, uh, to the Tidyverse Framework. And basically we have a, a suite of packages called uh, Tidy Models, which when you install it and load it, comes with a bunch of uh, modeling related packages, all of which kind of abide by the uh, Tidyverse Design Framework. And importantly for our use case, uh, the code that we're going to be developing looks a lot like other tidyverse functions that we've worked with in the sense that we're going to be building pipelines again. Um, there are many, many packages and uh, tidy models. Um, and so what I've highlighted here is a mix of the core packages and also some of the packages that we're um, going to be um, that we're going to be specifically using, even though it's not part of the core tidy models. So I've highlighted those here on this slide. Uh, the first one is Parsnip, which is a tidy unified interface for fitting these models. Uh, Broom is something we're going to use, uh, which converts statistical output to user-friendly formats. Uh, infer is for tidy statistical inference, which we'll get to when we talk more about uncertainty quantification and parameter estimation. Uh, R sample is used for data splitting and resampling, which we'll use for uh, model validation. And also recipes is a tidy interface for data pre-processing, which say which we'll say a little bit about, but won't be working uh, very. Um, uh, won't be working with um, for a very long time. You can see other models that are in the core, uh, other packages that are in the core tidy models. I've left their names there just so you um, have some sense into what uh, this suite of packages does, but we're not going to be talking a whole lot about those in this class, except potentially maybe some of you might want to go a little bit beyond what we're learning in the class for your uh, final projects, in which case you might find some of those um, packages helpful and you can find more information about all of these packages at tidymodels.org but um, for the ones that we're going to be using heavily we will be going through the details as well and another thing that i will say about tidy models is that we're going to try to not make too much of a distinction between which package specifically we're working with but remember that when you look at the help for a particular function you will always be able to see the name of the package next to the um, name of the function but instead of uh you know uh having you um having you having to worry about keeping track of which package things are coming from you can kind of think of this as we're using tidy models to do our modeling just like we're using tidyverse to do our data wrangling and visualization all right so how do we use tidy models to actually fit a model? Step one is to specify the model that we're building. So we're going to be uh, building a linear regression model. So the function we start with is linear reg, and you can see that it prints out as an output saying, all right, I am ready to use this model specification. Step two, is to define the model fitting engine. For now, we're going to be using LM, which those letters should uh, feel familiar from when we fit um, the smooth lines on our uh, ggplots with geom smooth, which stands for a linear model. So the computational engine that we're using is called LM. And I've 
um, italicized this word engine because I'm kind of throwing it out there without explaining it a whole lot. You can think about it as these uh, the tidy models package actually um, interfaces with many, many other R packages who do uh, so the work of fitting the models. But uh, tidy models basically provides um, a consistent interface to them. So you don't need to worry about for this package, I need to specify things this way, but for another package, I need to uh, write my uh, code a slightly different way. It gives you a coherent interface for um, all of these different engines, or you can think of them as different packages. We are going to be working with linear models for majority of this course. So oftentimes we're just going to be using set engine LM, uh, but we're going to show you a couple other options as well down the line. So our computational engine is a linear model. Then step three, we fit the model and we estimate the parameters using what we call formula syntax. So this formula syntax is something special to R and it is going to be, you'll see that it's used in many, many other places. And we've seen it used a couple places ourselves as well when we define, for example, facets for our visualizations. So in the third um, step, we're fitting a model uh, height, so that's our first variable versus, so whenever I see that fill tilde in the um, models, uh, the formula syntax, I read that out as versus. So height is on the y-axis versus width is on the x-axis. So my um, explanatory variable is width. And then I define the data, uh, which is the Paris paintings data. You might notice that this looks a little bit different than what we've said about tidyverse notation, where we kept saying over and over, data comes first, data comes first. And here things are a little bit different, and that's because the formula notation or the formula syntax in R uh, predates tidyverse, uh, and it is uh, given that R is a statistical computing language, it's important that we try to kind of stick to some of those norms so that um, as you learn this notation, um, working with other R packages uh, that may not necessarily follow the tidyverse principles will not feel completely foreign to you. So you'll see that in many, many different modeling packages, this sort of notation is used where we first give it the formula and then the data from which these variables are going to be picked. So that when we write the variables, we got to make sure that the way we type them out exactly matches the column headers in our data frame. So as a result, we get the model output. We can see coefficients, our intercept, and our slope for the width. So that's basically the default print method that R uses for, um, uh, for models. And uh, we can take a closer look at this. So if I was to use these uh, values from my model output to recreate that uh, formula that I showed you over the visualization earlier, I would say that the predicted height is equal to 3.6214 as the intercept plus 0.7808 as the slope times the width of the painting. So we now have an estimate for the intercept and the slope of this model. Uh, it's a positive slope, which is what we expected. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how we actually interpret those numbers in a second. But something that might have um, also caught your attention here is that this sort of output is not the sort of output that we're used to seeing in this course so far and that we're used to seeing with tidyverse functions. We're used to seeing things uh, when we run through some code to be spit out to us in the form of a data frame. So there is a pack, uh, function called tidy uh, that takes any model output, well, most model output, whatever it's implemented for, but it's lots and lots of models and definitely the ones we'll be covering in this class, takes that model output and tidies it up. And by what, what I mean by tidies it up is that it converts it to a tibble, tidy data frame. Uh, so we can see here is that we have our intercept, that's our first term, and the estimate for that is given here, the 3.62 that we saw earlier. And we also have our uh, other term, which is our explanatory variable, and the slope associated with that explanatory variable is given under the estimate column. These numbers are almost exactly the same as what we saw earlier, except they have been rounded um, in terms of uh, significant digits. And you'll see that there's more to this table. And we're gonna talk about some of it, but not all of it right now. The second column is called standard error. And for now, what I would like you to keep in mind is that that has to do with the uncertainty around those estimates. So we are estimating our intercept to be 3.62 and our slope to be 0.781. 
but obviously we have some uncertainty around it. And that column, the standard error column, tells us about the uncertainty around that. How we interpret those specific numbers, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, another concept in statistics is then using the estimates and the measure of this uncertainty to start thinking about the significance of particular variables. So the test statistic and the p-value are about those. Um, if you have done any previous um, statistics courses, it's very possible that you have heard about p-values before. It is not going to be a major focus of what we're doing um, in this course because we're going to be focusing on um, explaining uh, natural phenomena using models and also predicting things. But we will say a little bit about statistical, what we call hypothesis testing and making decisions with p-values at the end of this unit called making uh, rigorous conclusions. So let's hold off on that for a little bit. We will keep seeing these columns because they're part of the regression output, the standard error statistic and the p-value, but you'll see me not say a whole lot about them until it's time to do so. So for the time being, we're simply going to focus on this estimate column, which gives us an estimate for our intercept and an estimate for our slope. So what do I do with these numbers? How do I interpret them? Uh, the interpretation of the slope is that for each additional inch, the painting is wider. The height is expected to be higher on average by 0.781 inches. Now, important to note here, I'm using you know, quite wishy-washy language here. I'm not saying if you increase the width, this is what will happen to height. But what I'm saying is that as width increases, we expect the height to increase as well. Expect being a critical uh, word there on average. So not necessarily exactly by that amount for every single painting in our data set, but on average by 0.781 inches for every inch the painting is wider. And the intercept is then uh, about where width is equal to zero. So paintings that are zero inches wide are expected to be 3.62 inches high on average. Does that make any sense? Uh, probably not. We probably have no paintings that are zero inches wide in our data set. That doesn't make sense. But mathematically speaking, this line ex expands to infinity on either end. But in the previous video, we talked about this notion of extrapolation and saying something about your model beyond the reach of your data. And since we obviously don't have any paintings that are zero inches wide, the notion of interpreting that intercept in the context of these data does not make a whole lot of sense, but mathematically that number is there and it's there to adjust the height of this line. Um, another important thing to keep in mind is that correlation does not imply causation. Now, I don't want you to walk away thinking that correlation is useless or it's not informative. It, I am simply saying that it does not imply causation. So it's something we want to remember when we're interpreting model coefficients. There's a nice story about this in the um, XKCD cartoon here. Um, XKCD has something for everything that we're probably going to be talking about in this class. So this one is the one about correlation and causation. So this is why I was saying that we're using somewhat what might sound wishy-washy language, but actually it is quite precise. When we say things like expected and on average, we really mean something by those. And what we mean is not that make a painting wider and its height will go up. What we mean is that this is what we're observing in the data is happening for wider paintings compared to um, narrower paintings. So we've seen these parameters 3.62, 0 0.781, but how do we come up with those numbers? How do we do the parameter estimation? We're interested in beta zero, the population parameter for the intercept, and beta one, the population parameter for the slope in this following model. So we're trying to predict y from uh, using x, and the formula is intercept plus uh, slope times the value of the explanatory variable. And if you have population data, you can do this, but oftentimes we don't have population data. We usually have sample data, so we use sample statistics to estimate them. It might just look like notation change going from those Greek letters to the B0 and B1 to the Latin alphabet, but what we're trying to signal with that notation change here is that while we would like to estimate the betas, the best we can do is the Bs, the sample statistics, and that's why we report along with it the um, measures of uncertainty around them. 
how do we estimate these numbers? We use what we call the least squares regression. Now, note that there are other types of regression, uh, but we're going to be focusing mostly on least squares regression here. So the regression line, in this case, minimizes the sum of squared residuals. What do we mean by that? If the residual value, so that's uh, usually denoted with an E for error, but this is not to say it's error like an R error, like you did something wrong. It is by design there. It's simply the difference between the observed and the predicted values for any given data point. Then the regression line basically minimizes the squares of these numbers, the sum of the squared residuals. So we square each of these residuals and then we sum them up for our entire sample size. Why do we square them? There are two reasons for that. One of them is we want to get rid of the negative signs. Remember, some of our residuals are negative and some of them are positive. And uh, we want to get rid of the uh, negative signs so they don't all add up to zero when we sum them up. And you might be thinking, wouldn't an absolute value work for that? And in fact, that's right. And there are other um, ways of fitting models where we, you would be looking at minimizing the absolute uh, sum of the uh, residuals. But the one that's most commonly used is the least squares regression where we square them. And the reason for squaring them is to give uh, more weight to the residuals that are bigger. So instances where your model is more off uh, in the predictions. So to visualize them, let's just take a look at our data. Here's just the data. And then we're gonna overlay on it our model. So this is the least squares line in purple. And what I've uh, shown there in, with the orange dots on the plot is the predicted value. So our Y hats or our height hats. Um, for each of the values of the width for a painting, we have calculated what the predicted value would be and put those on our regression line. And then if we take the differences between the observed data and the predicted values, those um, vertical distances, those segments are basically our residuals. So we take those values, we square them and we sum them up and we try to minimize them. So imagine moving that line around and trying out a bunch of configurations for your line and ultimately settling on the one that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals. That's basically what the, um, iterative algorithm that's um, underneath the um, fitting of this model is doing. The properties of the least squares regression line is that first and foremost, the regression line goes through the center of mass point. So that's the average of X's and the average of Y's. In this case, it would be imagine finding the average of the widths of the paintings, that would be your X bar, and the average of the Y's of your painting, so that would be your uh, Y bar, the heights, and then think about where they um, meet in the middle, that's going to be the coordinate X bar, Y bar, and your uh, line always goes through that. And we can use that uh, property to actually then estimate our um, slope. Right. So if we actually that's a way if we can actually move, put those into our model formula, we can use that to solve for the slope, for example, if you know the uh, solve for the intercept. Sorry, if you know the slope, uh, the slope. Another property is that the slope has the same sign as the correlation coefficient. So the correlation coefficient, remember, measures the strength of the linear association between two numerical variables, and it can take on a negative value if the correlation is negative. So there's a negative relationship between the two or a positive value otherwise. And the slope will always have the same sign. It's because if we were calculating the slope by hand, the formula that we would use would be the correlation coefficient r times the ratio of the standard deviations of the um, y and the x variables. And we know that standard deviations are always positive. So sy over sx will always be positive, uh, meaning that the sign of the slope will always be the sign of the correlation coefficient. You can also think about it as the magnitude of the slope is going to be basically your correlation coefficient and then scaled by the ratio of the variabilities of the two variables. But um, those formulas are useful for conceptualizing what's happening under the hood. But our goal here in this course is not to make you hand calculate those numbers of intercept and slope, but instead to use those formulas to build some intuition around how um, models are fit and how these parameters are estimated.
Another property is that the sum of the residuals is zero. That's why we uh, minimize the sum of squared residuals. Otherwise, they would always be zero anyway when we sum them up. But so we have just as much uh, positive and as negative residuals in total. And finally, the residuals and x values are uncorrelated. This basically means that as you travel along the x axis, how off you are, how off your model is from the observed data, your predicted values are from the observed data, doesn't vary along with it. So the scatter around the line basically remains the same throughout the model. Um, let's now talk a little bit about models with categorical explanatory variables, and we'll keep things simple first and start with a categorical predictor with two levels and one that was already coded as zeros and ones. So that's that landscape variable we looked at before. Um, if the value is zero, then the painting has no landscape features, and if the value is one, then it has some landscape features. So fitting the model is exactly the same as before, and we're basically now uh, swapping out that width that we were using as a predictor with the lands all variable. And remember that we're using it as a categorical variable, not numeric, so that's why I wrap it in the factor function. But the rest of the um, code is exactly the same. I've just changed my formula. And here I have my model estimates, 22.7 as my intercept and negative 5.65 as my slope. What do I do with those numbers? So the slope basically tells us that the paintings with landscape features are expected on average to be 5.645 inches shorter than paintings without landscape features. And if we think about it, um, that might make sense because landscape uh, paintings, we would expect to be shorter on average, you know, not as tall as the portrait ones. So in fact, that negative sign makes sense. But note that how we interpreted the slope is a little bit different than how we interpreted the slope in the case of a numerical predictor. So the value of the slope basically is comparing the baseline level everyone comes first so in this case the one coded as zero to the other level uh the one coded as one and the intercept is again the same uh basically the value you would expect your response variable to have if your explanatory variable was zero but in this case that means something uh paintings that don't have any landscape features are expected on average to be 22.7 inches tall so zero is meaningful here because it doesn't mean a uh, painting that doesn't exist. It just means a painting that doesn't have landscape features. Um, let's take a look at another explanatory variable. And this time we're going to look at the school of the painting, which is informative about its style slash the artist. Usually the school of the painting matches with the artist, artist so Dutch, Flemish, or French, or German, but not necessarily. Sometimes it can indicate just the style of the painting as well. So in terms of fitting the model, our code is very similar. We've simply swapped out one explanatory variable for another. This one, it is an explanatory variable with um, multiple levels and it was already coded as character strings. So we don't need to wrap that around with the factor function. Um, R will know by default that since it's that no, it is not numbers, that it is a categorical variable here. And let's take a look at this output. Now we're seeing more lines in our output, right? We're used to seeing just an intercept and one slope because we had one explanatory variable, but now I'm seeing six separate slopes here. So that's the 2.33, 10.2, 1.65, so on and so forth. And the um, covariates associated with those, these terms, it's the school of the painting, which is what we expected, but then the actual levels as well. So Dutch, Flemish, French, German, so on and so forth. What happened here? We didn't uh, give the model multiple explanatory variables. Why are we getting multiple slopes out? When we are working with explanatory uh, categorical variables with multiple levels, we then um, need to think about what we call dummy variables. So when the categorical explanatory variable has many levels, they're actually encoded to dummy variables. What this means is that the each coefficient that we saw there, the estimate, uh, describes the expected difference between heights in that particular school compared to the baseline level. So how does this dummy variables or dummy coding work out? 
So here on the right hand side, you can see uh, just the first 20 rows of our data, right? We have the names of the paintings, their heights, and then also the schools of the painting. And there are a total of seven levels that this variable can take. Uh, A for Austrian, DFL for Dutch Flemish, F for French, G for German, I for Italian, S for Spanish, and X for unknown. And what we're doing when we're doing dummy coding is we're basically converting the single categorical variable into many categorical variables, but the number of categorical variables we need to use is one less than the uh, number of levels the categorical variable has. Why? I'm going to start at the end and work my way backwards. Basically, a new categorical variable called x, where it takes the value of zero if the painting is anything, but it, it has a known school, so it's not any of the other six levels, but the school is unknown, then we would encode that particular painting as one. If a painting is Spanish, then it would get zeros for all the other um, uh, explanatory variables that we just created, and we'll get a one for Spanish. And similarly for Italian, and similarly for German, and similarly for French, and similarly for Dutch Flemish. So a painting that's Dutch Flemish gets a one for the DFL variable and gets zeros for everything else. Well, what if a painting has zeros for everything, for all of these new variables that we created? Then it's Austrian. It's none of the others. So it's the first uh, level that we had. Now, it's Austrian happens to start with A, and that's the first um, level that we had. So if we don't intervene, R will order them um, alphabetically. But when I said we're creating these new dummy variables, I'm not doing anything. I didn't do anything in my code. I was very honest with my code to you. I just showed you we just fit the data with the categorical variable. And what R does under the hood before it fits the model is actually creates these dummy variables for us. So you don't need to worry about creating dummy variables. You just need to worry about understanding how they work and how to interpret them. So let's now take a look at these um, parameters that were estimated for us. Um, so the intercept is 14, and remember our baseline level was A, Austrian paintings. So Austrian school paintings are expected, on average, to be 14 inches tall. If we look at the next um, uh, estimate, 2.33 for Dutch Flemish, what that tells me is that Dutch Flemish school paintings are expected, on average, to be 2.33 inches taller than Austrian school paintings. If we look at French, um, there the number is 10.2. Again, we're comparing it to our baseline level Austrian school. So French paintings are expected on average to be 10.2 inches taller than Austrian school paintings, so on and so forth, and, and we can go on. All of these are positive uh, slopes, which means that all of the other schools have, um, on average, um, are taller than Austrian paintings. I don't know enough about um, history of paintings and how the Austrian school works to guess whether that makes sense in context or not, but that's where working with the professionals who curated this data would be helpful to see, do these results make sense to you? So the takeaway message here is that when we're fitting models with categorical explanatory variables, we do dummy coding. Um, the dummy coding is not something we have to think too critically about when we only have two levels because it kind of makes sense that you're comparing one level to the other. But when you have multiple explanatory variables, the interpretation gets a little more complicated because what we need to keep in mind is that each of those slope estimates are comparing the particular level to the baseline. And we said the baseline was picked because it started with the letter A. It was in alphabetical order. Could I change which one the baseline is? Of course I can. And we've talked about uh, ways of reordering uh, our factor levels using the four cats package. So we could do some data pre-processing to change, to make that change first. And then we would be fitting the model uh, with the new ordered levels, in which case you could be more deliberate about which one you want to be your baseline level. The alphabetical setting is rarely the best option, but it's useful to know that that's what happens by default.